Uh, I went to see the Ali fight, 1974, uh, when he fought uh, uh, in, in Manila, when he fought Frazier. And uh, 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 he and I had become friends uh, in 74, and I was at that time the chairman of the board of STP. And we had a, a jet airplane, I'd fly him around this airplane and go to see him, and, and, uh, and we had become buddies. And uh, uh, John Y. Brown decided that he wanted to start the Muhammad Ali Boxing School in Louisville, Kentucky. And he asked me if I would uh, give some money from STP as a part of the promotion of this boxing school. And I said, sure, you know, the same people who go to watch uh, cars race, go to watch boxing matches, and this is a good uh, investment for STP. And, and yeah, we'll put up uh, uh, some money to start the Muhammad Ali Boxing School, and we did. And so he asked me if, uh, 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 to come to the opening of it, and it developed that Ali was in Natchez, Mississippi, uh, the day, uh, the day before that, uh, and his plane broke down, and I, and John White called me and said, "Would you stop in Natchez, Mississippi?" I was in Fort Lauderdale. Would you stop in Natchez, Mississippi, and pick up Ali and bring him up here? And I said, "Sure," I did, and went to Natchez, Mississippi. I was supposed to pick him up at 10 o'clock. We sat there on the I sat there on the airplane. This end of this runway. A little bit of a short runway with a little bit of a uh, house that wasn't any bigger than a, co the, a little log cabin, which was closed. It was at nighttime. And I sat there on this airplane waiting for Ali. 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Finally, 2 o'clock, he shows up. And with this little uh, motorcade with the sheriff and whatever, he'd been there making some speech and whatever. And so he gets out of the uh, uh, car. And I've never, uh, this, this is the first time I've ever met him. I've never met him. He gets out of the car, and he, used, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, John J. Hooker, I always said, John J. Hooker, uh, tell me this, who's flying that airplane? I said, we've got a good pilot. And he said, uh, uh, we ain't got to use the N-word. And he said, he said I said, no, uh, this fellow happens to be white. He said, well, you know, said we, and he used the N-word again, talking about himself. He said, you know, we... Uh, we know all about how to play football. We know all about how to play basketball. We know all about how to box, but we don't know nothing about flying no airplanes. And I ain't getting on that airplane. I said, come on here, get on the airplane, and make a long story short, he did. Gets on the airplane, and he absolutely hates the airplane. How he's done what he's done in terms of flying around the world, given his, the, the dislike he has for airplanes. I mean, he, he holds on to the seat. He, he, uh, he, he uh, He's obviously agitated. So he gets on the airplane. It's been raining cats and dogs. We fly out of the, the weather, and uh, he relaxes a little bit. And I say to him, uh, you know, uh, I'm so glad to meet you and come down here and pick you up because you are, you're a real hero of mine. And he looked at me. He said, you know I ain't no hero of yours. He said, you're a white guy. Uh, you know I'm no hero of yours. I said, you're wrong about that. You are. And he said, why? I said, because you stood up against the war, number one, and number two, you get in that ring, you fight these guys, you got a lot of courage, and, I, and you're a real, real hero of mine. He said, uh, do you know about the half dream? And I said, uh, no, what's a, what's a half dream? He said, when you box, Papa. He said, when you box, he said, Papa, all of a sudden somebody hits you, and you're in the half dream, and you don't know where you are, and you hear the saxophones, uh, the, the alligators start playing the saxophone, and the snakes start playing the drums, and you start seeing these stars, and you don't know where you are, and you're in the half dream. And he said, all boxers get in the half dream every now and then. He said, I get in the half dream. He said, these other boxers, say they get in the half dream, and they drop their arms down. And said, when they drop their arms down, they get knocked out. And said, when I get in the half dream, I put my arms up, just like this. He says, nobody knows why I put my arms up. I don't know why I put my arms up. All I know is I put my arms up instead of down and I don't get knocked out. And it not only makes me the greatest, it makes me the greatest of all times. I'm sitting there watching him tell this story. I haven't done him justice. I mean, he was absolutely fascinating. And uh, I said to him, you know, have you ever heard of a poem called If? And he said, uh, if I don't know no if, I said, there's a poem called If, and there's a line in it that says, if you can hold on when there's nothing within you except the will that says hold on. 
And I said, when you're in these boxing matches, uh, do you hold on? I, I, tell me about that. And he said, say that again. So I repeated, if you hold on. He had a friend with him named, named uh, 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 no, my, no, but I'll tell you in a minute. No, uh, no, but no, my own, a great pal, a great friend of his, his best friend. And he said, take that down, take that down. So he takes down the line and, and so forth. And we keep on talking and, and talk about why he uh, stood up against the wall, why he didn't, uh, uh, Howard Bingham is a friend's name. He's his number one best friend, been all over the world with him. Never, uh, he, he's been uh, everywhere. One time I asked Howard Bingham, I said, Howard, what is the most unusual thing you know about Muhammad Ali? It took him about 30 seconds. He says, I've never heard him complain about anything. When he got uh, hurt, when he lost his money, when he got indicted, when he got divorced, when he got sick, I've never heard him complain about one thing. And you know, that's, I, I, neither have I, and I don't believe anybody else has. That's an unbelievable statement. Never heard him, I complain if I get the hiccups. Uh, uh, I never heard him complain about anything. So anyway, uh, uh, we have this come together when he's talking to me about the, the half dream and I'm asking him about uh, uh, holding on and we've developed this bond. He, 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 after we dedicate to school, about two weeks later, he's going to, to, Phil, to the Philippines to fight the thrill in Manila. And uh, he said, come up to Chicago and, and we're gonna have a, uh, a goodbye party for me going over to Manila. He said, there'll be a lot of folks there, my pals come, so I go. And to this uh, Chicago at the, what was hotel? Uh, uh, Continental Hotel and uh, a big crowd. And he's got this uh, standing uh, line for reception, shaking hands with people come in. So I, I'm going through the line, just like everybody else is getting the line. I get to him, puts his finger right in my chest. Says, if you can hold on when there's nothing within you except the will that says hold on. Gives me this big hug. And then he finishes during the reception line. We go back and, and sit at the table and have supper and, and uh, we talk all through the thing. He says, I want you to come to, to uh, Manila. I said, hell, I can't go to Manila. I work for STP. We, we, I, I can't, you know, I'd, I'd like to come, but I, I can't do that. He said, I want you to come. I said, I can't do that. Uh, but I appreciate the invitation. Anyway, he goes to Manila and he has to fight. And uh, it was a hell of a fight. It's 96 degrees. They fight, fight, fight. Finally gets in the 13th round. Whoppo, uh, uh, Frazier hits him. And he goes in this sort of Staggered away, he goes back to the uh, to the uh, stool at the end of the round, and he uh, uh, Dundee is his manager there. Dundee sees that he's uh, all hurt and so forth, uh, but he gets up, goes back, and 14th round, he, when he gets up, uh, uh, Frazier has hit, has hit him in the eyes, and when he went to the to the stool, he he had a hard time finding the stool. Uh, it wasn't in a half dream, but his eyes were were disabled uh, for, for a moment. He goes, sits down on the stool, won't let uh, Dundee throw in the towel, gets up and he can't see Frazier. Goes at him anyway. Gets out there, whop, 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 whop. Next thing you know, Frazier can't answer the bell for the 15th round. And now they hold up, Ali's won. Ali stands up, he's so tired, 106 degrees, 15 rounds, 14 rounds plus. Uh, and he sits down on the stool, and they say, what do you, what do you say about Herbert Muhammad? Uh, and he, uh, Herbert Muhammad was his manager, and he talks about Herbert Muhammad. And then he looks in the, uh, and said, uh, and then he looks in the screen, and he says, I want to say hello to my friend John J. Hooker. And you can imagine, I, I mean, I was just uh, thrilled beyond, I'm sitting in this church, I mean, in this movie theater in uh, Miami, Florida, and there was uh, all these enormous number of people, 90 some odd percent, maybe 95 percent of them were black people. And, and they were all cheering Ali, and I was so thrilled to be with them and be in that moment and share that moment with them. And, and when he said, I, I won't say hello, but I turned to this fellow who happened to be black who, who lived with me, his name was, was, name was Red Man. I said, Red, what did he say? He said, he said, what you think he said? I said, what did he say? He said, I, he said he, uh, I want to say hello to my friend John J. Hooker. And I started to stand up and say, ladies and gentlemen, I am John J. Hooker. But I restrained myself. But anyway, that's, I must have told you that story. And, and uh, 
uh, it was a moment of great exhilaration. And you know, uh, uh, moments in life in which you think are too big for you, uh, and if you have that facility to hold on when there's nothing within you that except the will that says hold on.